Ben Lewis. Some people call me an art critic, and I'm at the Venice Biennale 2011, one of the largest art exhibitions in the world. You could think about it as the Olympics of art or the World Cup of art. Around a hundred different countries put on exhibitions in national pavilions. There's always a competition to see which nation has produced the best exhibition by the best artist. Well, I've just got lost inside the Mike Nelson installation at the British Pavilion. And like most of his work, you go through a series of corridors into a series of spooky rooms and up staircases into dimly lit cubby holes with strange bits of equipment lying around. And you wonder, what is it? It's a bit like the dream experience. You never know what's going to come around the next corner or where you're going to be. Originally, I was thinking of making something that was going to be on the exterior of the building. But um, it seemed like an impossibility to work you know, with the exterior of the building and the Biennale because it's just the Jardine is like a kind of theme park. Do you imagine different people inhabiting different rooms? No. What is it? Then? It's more about material, I think, matter than people. I'm kind of more interested in the kind of uh, the inability to quite understand what some of the material is and what function it ever was. You know, there's certain objects and debris sort of like which has no human sort of explanation. I suppose structurally, in terms of making something like this, you come up with an idea, like a certain, say, a conceptual framework or a narrative framework, and that enriches as you build it. I suppose what I wanted to do with the work here, you know, would be to sort of like to make sense of the world through one's own histories. So I've done this 10 years ago, exactly the same in a sense. So I spent 10 weeks in Venice in 2001. That sense of um, retreading one's own steps was very sort of strong. Your work is very cinematic, actually, in many ways. Is that, is that deliberate? Primarily, in most, when I started making work in this way, it was uh, yeah, purposeful. But now I think it's... Um, that purpose has kind of been lost in the in in time to some degree. It just is. A lot of it's quite formal to me in a sculptural sort of sense. The actual kind of materiality of it, the, the delivery of it. I'm outside the Swiss Pavilion. I'm quite excited, maybe even a bit nervous, because I'm about to interview the inverted commas art star, Thomas Hirschhorn, who's well known for his intensely political installations made out of things like wrapping paper, cardboard, and silver foil. Well, I'm deep inside the crystal of resistance. Why the crystals, and why the resistance? Why the crystals? Because I love its beauty, that it, every crystal is between 14 and 19 million year old. I like the fact that it's something mysterious, but also very banal, because it's the most banal mineral. When I look around, I feel like you're telling me, resist the evils of modern capitalism. Maybe I'm reading too far into it. I think this is a very simplest way. Why not? But uh, in order to, to work out the question of resistance as such, I wanted to use the pictures and the elements of today, of the opinion, the information, the uh, media and technological world surrounding me. But not in order to, to criticize it, but in order to try to make a distance between the space and the time. Now when you tell me your sharp but brilliant first opinion, that's a shame to me because I again think I didn't get it. I'm often wrong in my interpretations of art, but I still plough on resolutely in the hope that one day I'll get it right. I feel in this installation you've introduced a couple of new materials, like sort of earbuds. Yeah, thank you for this, uh, for this uh, observation, it's true, yeah? they are. And I like, of course, the earbuds because this is an universal material, as the other material I'm working with. Silver paper, tape, plastic, neons, photocopies. They are materials that everybody knows and uses. I like to cover the ground and the, the walls, and here also the ceiling, 
to me, it gives the possibility, or I hope so, to make the work mentally transportable. It's not linked to this specific space. I have to work with the space, not for the space, not against the space, but with the space. As I went round to installation, a couple of people thought I looked a bit like you. So they wanted to, yeah. but to hit you. And I wasn't sure whether I should impersonate you and start explaining the work. And what I now know is completely the wrong word. Better, better, better. I'm so glad I can <laughs> say. We're in the heart of the Venice Biennale 2011. We're in the Giardini. This is the main drag where all the national pavilions are. I'm standing in front of an upside-down tank in front of the American pavilion. It's the work of Jennifer Alora and Guillermo Calzadilla. What were the first thoughts that came into your mind when you got a phone call inviting you to represent America at the Venice Biennale? Something that we did here with the US pavilion, uh, it's to take an idea and uh, make it in capital letters, uh, make it bold, underline it, highlight it, through in such an excessive manner that things as, such as irony and humor and absurdity will, will come up. Because we were invited to make a proposition for the U.S. Pavilion, of course this whole question of representation became a very big uh, part of uh, the whole development of the exhibition. How does you represent the state? How do you represent the United States as a body, as a whole? And of course that's impossible to do. No one could ever imagine how one could represent an entire nation. But then we became very interested in the idea of the human uh, human body, one individual's body, as an interesting measure for all of the works in the exhibition. So everything in the exhibition is scaled or keyed to the human figure, to the human body. So what kind of symbol have we got behind us and what kind of symbols do we have inside your pavilion? We just uh, started with um, things that had certain qualities in common, but that at the same time have nothing to do with each other. So like in the piece of the tank and the treadmill, both share in common this uh, tread, right? This thing that needs to be moving in the same um, way. And by putting them together, create a whole set of associations that can range from everything from losing weight to waging wars, I guess. When, when I saw the tank and the treadmill in operation, mm. only one meaning came to mind. Uh -huh. And that was American military power, the old strategies. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's obviously also there. Another thing that I found interesting working with the athletes who are actually running on top of the treadmill, who come from USA track and field, is to see their, their physical bodies and the training that goes into the uh, production of the athletic body itself. Which goes back uh, to Greek, the relationship between sports and militarism. Guillermo and I uh, like this concept of the monstrous dimension, and I think all of the works that we try to make, if they are successful, they have this monstrous dimension, which means that they'll exceed anything that we can just say in this five-minute interview, but will have some sort of meaning that will be more precise and, and, and meaningful in, in context beyond this, uh, this moment here. you get the first idea to create the installation inside? I tried to work with kind of a, a labyrinth but instead of the normal labyrinth that starts on the floor and ends somewhere above eye level, my labyrinth is coming from the ceiling and stops in, in crotch height. And um, that's, that's kind of a sub-theme of the exhibition, uh, a focus on the legs. We tend to focus on the top and we only use the legs and to, to walk or for sexual activities, and I, I thought they deserve uh, special attention. And does that relate to the legs of the chairs that are hanging in certain, certain sculptures, a position quite high up that are based on chair legs? I tried to find a way to, to work with sculptures on the wall, and in, in everyday uh, culture, people hang guns, crosses, and trophies on the wall, and that was kind of my, my initial. Why did you pick chair legs? Is this, is this part of a sort of leg theme? This design was invented by the British carpenter Chippendale and he tried to imitate uh, human legs with his table legs. And I just took them apart and 
dismantle them and put them together in the wrong way. The paintings in there, though, they're... why do you alter them in that way? Because these people, they have these sort of prostheses on their faces. When I change the people, they're not damned to, to wear these forever. It's, it's more an apparatus for desire than an instrument of torture. A large queue is forming of people. We're going to see your work. Yeah. How do you want them to experience it? It's crucial that the people are actually going inside because you need uh, quite some public that it's the whole thing becomes a little bit humorous. It's not a construction that works without the legs and it's just something nice and elegant. Right. I'm over. You're the first artist I've ever met who's obsessed with legs. There was always, in a maybe very naive way, admiring fetishists because I thought they have some kind of secret key uh, that opens up a completely different world for them. Well, I think your work really has legs, as we say in English. What does it mean? It means it's good. <laughs> it means it's got a strong foundation. <laughs>Russian artists, you love this sort of over-the-top church, rave, circus atmosphere. We live by living through our emotions, and that's what this life all about. What's the artistic algorithm behind these search results? What? So can you tell me what you've actually built? I've built a water cleaning system. We don't serve it to the people. We give it back to the canal. Why don't you serve it to the people? Because that would have been too much a solution. They're just about to do a photo call outside the German pavilion because the Germans are the surprise winners of this year's Venice Biennale. There's someone trying to make a noise through this yeah. horn. Well, that's Maypare, isn't it? Oh, you got it there. You got the angle right. What do you think of the Biennale? I'd say that it's quite interesting. Quite interesting? Yeah. Okay. Now, in the past uh, two or three days, you've probably done 20 or 30 interviews. And this is our and last this one. This is our last one. <laughs> <All right. laughs>